You're listening to Big World Network. Amazing Grace, Episode 9. Written by James Helvig, read by Megan Hedin. Sadie told me you know someone who is hurting children. Have you told the police? Charlie sits at the table, a hot cup of coffee warming his hands. Sullen, he nods in response to Tammy's question. Mother Steele sets a pair of aspirin near Charlie's cup. He picks them up and swallows each with a sip of coffee. And? Tammy prods. Meeting her gaze, he responds angrily. And nobody listens to a damn drunk over a businessman. Leaning forward on the table and looking into his eyes, Tammy says icily, "'Gunny, we don't have time for this shit. I'm listening, and we're damn well going to hash this out. You get me, Marine?' Sitting straighter in his chair, eyes widening in surprise, the former NCO barks, "'Ma'am!' A ghost of a smile tugs at the corner of Charlie's mouth, and then he asks, "'Who are you? It's been a long time since anyone's called me that.' Extending her arm and firmly shaking hands with the man, Tammy sits back, looking at the warring emotions on Charlie's face. Curiosity, shame, and pride are intermingled there. Once upon a time I was an army major. I did some snooping, and I have seen your jacket. I'd like the details of your situation, but I can extrapolate some of it. First, I need to explain to me what you know and how you know it. Charlie looks from Tammy to Mother Steele and back again. Turning the cup around in his hands, he asks... Where's Sadie? She was concerned that you'd be upset for involving me. She left a few hours ago, Tammy tells him. Are you? Shrugging, Charlie takes a long drink of coffee before replying. I guess not. Setting his empty cup on the table, he reaches into the oversized thigh pocket of his cargo pants and removes a battered notebook. He places that on the table and pushes it toward Tammy. It's all there, ma'am. I modified a standard salute report. The son of a bitch is careful about his targets. He only uses siblings as far as I can tell, probably threatening the kid with harming the younger child if they tell. His hands ball into fists as he continues. I tried to do this right. Two weeks I watched this bastard. I took it to the police and they blew me off. Slamming his fist onto the table, Charlie stands, yelling, I can't let it be. Charlie is shaking with rage and gripping the table tightly. Head down and panting, the man struggles to regain control. Tammy holds out a hand, stopping Mother Steele from going to the man. She recognizes some of the signs of PTSD. Standing, she says sternly, Gunny! Sweat trickles down Charlie's forehead. Opening his clenched eyes, he looks into Tammy's steady blue gaze. Take a breath. Another. Focus on me, Marine. It takes a few minutes, but slowly Charlie comes down. Tammy coaches and murmurs encouragement until he slumps back into his chair. Reclaiming her own seat, Tammy flips through the notebook, jaw clenching tighter with each detail she reads. Seeing her distress, Mother Steele brings over fresh coffee, taking the notebook from Tammy and slipping it into a large pocket of her robe. The police can review this later. How did you get this information, Charlie? she asks, refilling his mug. Sitting between the two former soldiers, she clasps her hands together, waiting for a response. Sighing loudly, Charlie thanks Mother Steele and explains that he found out what was happening by accident while looking for a place to get warm. A second-story fire escape facing the rear of the daycare's building was positioned close to a boiler exhaust vent. Climbing down from the roof, Charlie had thought it the perfect spot to be alone, safe from other people, and warmer than he was usually allotted. The small rectangular window was slightly below his vantage point. With the sun setting before five, he'd had a clear view of what he thought was a storage area. Over a two-week period, he'd observed a man who brought three different children to the room and abused them. He'd witnessed five incidents in fourteen days. Charlie looks into Mother Steele's tight-lipped face and says, I watched from across the street for two days as they closed. I'm almost certain the pervert owns the place, or manages it anyway. I figured if I took him out, the cops would have to check out my story. At least he wouldn't be hurting anybody else. Grim-faced, Tammy nods in understanding. Standing, she tells Charlie, I've got some equipment to gather up. Get yourself fed and ready, Gunny. We're going out on that fire escape before the sun goes down. Not waiting for an acknowledgement, she turns and strides out.
Charlie stares after Tammy, noticing her hands are balled into white-knuckled fists. Looking at Mother Steele, he mutters, I don't think pissing her off is a very good idea. Taking a deep breath and placing her right hand in Charlie's left, Mother Steele squeezes lightly, replying, Indeed. That's something you and I need to discuss, Mr. Beck. Listening intently, Charlie's eyebrows raise as the details of what the older woman is asking of him sink in. Gripping the railing, Tammy abruptly stands, turning her back on the events being played out in the adjacent building. Three days of surveillance with a parabolic microphone and a telescopic video camera have come to this. Charlie was right about the children. The first two days had been an exercise in patience, but this was too much. To make matters worse, Charlie's surly attitude and his insistence in shadowing Tammy's every move were grating on her nerves. His years as a marine sniper had come to the forefront and had so far won out over his addictions, but he wasn't exactly happy about it. The camera had been recording for fifteen minutes. Fuck this, Beck. I'm not waiting any more. Grabbing her arm, Charlie tells her, Stick to the plan, Major. The cops are on their way. Two calls on Mac's voicemail, she snaps. They should have been here by now. Let me go, mister. She knows that Charlie can see the barely harnessed rage in her face. He wants the bastard dead, too. All he needs is to let go. Instead, he says, All right, but we go together. Releasing her arm, Charlie watches Tammy kneel to release the landing's drop-down ladder. The skin is exposed on her right wrist as she steadies herself, waiting for the screeching metal to halt its descent. Bringing a taser smoothly from his pocket before Tammy has the chance to notice, Charlie places it firmly against her wrist and, as her head snaps around, presses the firing stud. Tammy crumples to the metal landing, body convulsing. Pulling her back to the building's wall, Charlie leans close, speaking into her ear. Sorry, Major. The old nun was right. I can't let you down there. Taking her phone, Charlie hurries down the ladder. Son of a bitch. Grunting with effort, Tammy rolls over and watches Charlie's receding figure exit the far side of the alley. Pushing herself to her knees, she mutters vehemently, Wrong move, Gunny. Cursing, she forces her still shuddering body clumsily downward. Snarling at the 911 dispatcher, Charlie snaps, This is the fourth call, damn it! Get somebody here or there's gonna be bloodshed! Disgusted, he hangs up. Immediately the phone begins to buzz and he turns it off. Stuffing it into his coat, he runs down the alley, the cold handle of his issue K-bar knife digging into his side. Panting, he rounds the corner, heading towards the daycare's entrance. Dropping the last few feet and landing, knees bent, Tammy glares down the alley and pushes her body into an awkward run. Growing stronger with each stride, she grimaces as the lights of a police cruiser flash by the exit. Shit, Charlie. Please, God, let him be waiting outside. Fat chance, she growls aloud, increasing her stride. Nearing the corner, she hears doors slamming and muted voices yelling commands. Glass shatters as she exits the alley, and two men lie entangled in the shards. Charlie straddles the plump, balding man they'd been observing, his left hand pinning the pummeled man's head to the ground, and his right hand holding the razor-edged K-bar to his throat. The police officers have weapons drawn and are screaming demands at what they perceive as an enraged homeless man. Stepping into their line of fire, Tammy yells, Stop! He's the one who called you! Charlie, let him go! Bleeding from a gash on his forehead and arm, the former Marine's eyes look up at Tammy, his grip never wavering. He's a piece of shit, ma'am. He's got it coming. Taking a knee, Tammy extends her hand towards the NCO. She's acutely aware of the maneuvering police around them, trying to position themselves for a shot. Give me the blade, Gunny. I'm not willing to trade your life for this scum. Looking from Tammy to the crowd and back into the building, Tammy knows that Charlie must be looking at the tear-streaked face of the little boy who had been in the back room. Slowly raising the knife, he expertly flips it and hands it to her handle first. Smiling at Charlie, Tammy helps the man stand as the police swarm in, cuffing all three of them. Sputtering denials, the battered business owner is hauled to his feet. Tammy then notes the arrival of Captain Reynolds. Turning to the proudly erect Marine, she says softly, I owe you one, Gunny. More loudly, she states in anger, As for you, you piece of crap! Closing the distance in a single stride, she headbutts the pervert squarely in the face, breaking his nose and knocking him back to the ground. Max strides into the chaos and barks orders at the officers who are struggling to push her back. 
That's enough. Bring these two over to me. Shut this down. And somebody get that garbage off my sidewalk. Taking Tammy's arm, Mac heads toward an ambulance with Charlie in tow. Motioning at the EMS technician, he growls, You got some splainin' to do. If I take these cuffs off, are you gonna behave? As the medical personnel tends to his head, Charlie chuckles and says to the police commander, I ain't hold her until that asshole is gone. I sure could use a drink. Rolling her eyes, Tammy turns her back on Charlie and presents her wrist to Mac. Unlocking the cuffs, Mac studies the odd pair with a shake of his head. When Charlie tells him where to recover the camera and recorder, he asks sarcastically, Just happen to have that stuff lying around? Charlie winks and grins broadly. Found it, he says. Mac runs a hand through his hair, climbing into the ambulance with them. Charlie is going to need stitches. Pulling a silver flask from his pocket, Mac hands it to Charlie before turning to Tammy. You're giving me ulcers, swear to God. Taking a sip when Charlie passes her the flask, Tammy then hands it back to the captain, saying insipidly, Quit bitching. It's not my fault your people are slow. After a long drink, Mac places the flask back into his jacket, receiving a scowl from Charlie. Well, work on it, your holiness. See you at the hospital. Exiting the rear of the vehicle before it can take off, Mac slams the door shut. Sighing loudly, Tammy mutters, I really gotta work on my people skills. The EMS technician working on Charlie's injured arm grumbles plainly, No shit. Charlie is too busy howling with laughter to notice Tammy's glare. Big World Network.